All right, let's talk about how we can use imagery to boost memory. So notice this word at the top of the slide, imagery mnemonics. Mnemonics are memory strategies. It's a Latin root. And so we got the silent M, which is, is not a very common structure, the silent M, but apparently it's a thing. So the first imagery mnemonic I wanted to describe is referred to in psychology as the method of loci, but you might have heard of it described as a memory palace. So either term is fine. Um, method of loci, the, the word loci there is plural for um, locus. It's a Latin word also, which means location. So the method of location or memory palace. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna pretend like we're trying to remember a shopping list. And um, I'm gonna use the method of loci to, um, I want you to try and use the method of loci to try to remember these um, items on the shopping list. I'm gonna pretend like I'm in, starting off in the Brady Bunch kitchen. I'm not exactly sure how this became my, my memory palace location. Um, maybe it was offered to me when I first learned about memory palaces, but for some reason, I visualize the Brady Bunch house when I'm doing my me memory palace. You can think of your own house. You can think of any house you want to. Um, the only criterion is that it needs to have a uh, second floor because at one point we're going to climb the stairs in our memory palace. So think of some two story house that you know well enough that you can play along. Um, now I'm going to give you an item on the shopping list and then I'm going to help you to generate the imagery that will allow you to tie the shopping list item to the location. And that's the process of the method of loci. Okay, so the first thing on our shopping list is honey. So what I want you to imagine is that there's honey spilling out of the upper cupboard, pooling on the countertop, and then spilling from the countertop down onto the floor and running off in a rivulet, like a little river of honey. Um, so you've got this water, this series, you know, this dual level waterfall of honey and then a river of honey going across the kitchen floor. Now, when you look over at the eating area, it could be the table or the island, it doesn't matter. You look at the um, eating area, there's a big salad bowl and it's filled until it's mounded up with um, dog kibble. And there's a dog eating from that bowl with their front paws on the on the you know, dining room table or the island or whatever, and their hind quarters on the seat, and they're eating dog kibble out of this bowl. Now you walk out of the kitchen into the neighboring room, and in my case, um, there's shag carpet. In your visualization, it might be a rug or whatever. Um, but when you look down at it, you realize as you're walking, you're hearing, so you look down and you realize that there is sugar embedded from the backer all the way to the tips of the the carpet or the rug it's completely full of sugar then when you look at the couch instead of throw pillows on the couch there are little pyramids of oranges in each place where normally a pillow would be as if these oranges think that they're throw pillows now you go up the stairs and as you're climbing the stairs each tread is completely um, like carpeted, but with slices of bread. So as you're climbing the stairs, you're walking on bread. Now, when you get upstairs, you go in the bathroom and the bathtub is completely full and floating on the surface of the water are raw pork chops just floating around on the surface of the water. Then you go into the neighboring bedroom, which in my case is the girl's bedroom in the Brady Bunch, and on that dresser, the top drawer is open. There's a bottle of milk on, on its side with no lid on it on the top of the um, dresser. And that top drawer is just completely full of milk and all the contents of the drawer are floating around in that milk. Then you go to that bed that's next to it and you pull back the covers and you see that somebody has taken an entire bag of potato chips, crunched them up and put them all inside the bed and then covered it up. So when you pull back the covers, all these chips are, and all the greasy marks and everything are all right there in the, in the bed. All right, now it's time to go grocery shopping. All right. And you know, if we're normal people, we forgot our list. So thank goodness we did a memory palace, right? So to recall what we need to buy while we're at the grocery store, we have to return to the original spot in our memory palace. 
the original lo locus, right? So we're in the kitchen and we look at the upper cupboards and that helps us to remember that we need to buy honey. Then we look at the table and we see the salad bowl and we see dog kibble. And then we walk into the next room and as we're walking, we're, we're hearing as we walk and that reminds us that we need to get some sugar. And then we look at the couch and that reminds us of the oranges. Climbing the stairs reminds us that we need some bread. Going into the bathroom and looking at the tub reminds us that we need pork chops. Going into the girls' room, we look at the dresser and we remember we need milk. And the bed reminds us that we need potato chips. So with this method, you could remember theoretically any amount of information. And in fact, the antique ancient um, you know, Greek orators, you know, in like the second century BC, were giving these really long speeches using the method of loci. They were imagining like whole passages of their speech being housed behind this rock or on that column or whatever. And they'd sort of walk down the street or they'd walk through the palace or they'd walk through whatever they were doing and mentally retrieve whole passages of text that they were going to recite. I've never really tried this method using abstract things like that. You know, I've only ever done it with concrete things like a shopping list. Um, but you can see how effective it can be. You know, one trial learning, if you've gotten a really good visualization, you'll notice a lot of the visualizations I gave you were really, you know, odd so that they'd be more memorable. But you can also imagine that you could have some errors. Like you could still come home with missing something off your shopping list because you forgot to look in the bathroom or you forgot to um, look at the couch or whatever and you could miss things. And that's what the Greek orators would say. They'd go, oh my gosh, I forgot that section of my speech. It was behind the rock. I forgot to look. Um, so yeah, you can still have memory gaps while doing this. Um, but if you establish, let's say you're learning a, a list of vocabulary words for the foreign language that you're taking. And um, so you could use this method. And, you know, if you rehearse it over and over again, you're going to get it to the point where you're not going to make an error. You, you'll remember to look at the at the kitchen cupboards or whatever. Um, so this is one way that you can use visualization to boost your memory. Another way is to do what's called the peg word technique. Now, normally to demonstrate the peg word technique in class, I have students shout out just, um, you know, concrete nouns, anything that they want me to remember. Um, but I, and, and then I have a student who writes the words up on the board so that we can, so that the class can see the list of words, but the, the students behind me and I can't see it because this isn't a trick, it's a technique. So I really want to make it clear that I'm not just sort of, you know, doing some kind of sleight of hand. It's it's literally a technique for remembering things. It works really well for a list of words. So that's why I have a, you know, a student number the, the items and, um, and like that. But so what I'm going to do, and I, so obviously I could be tricking you if I wanted and I'm not going to, um, but I just kind of want to show you how it's done, right? So let's imagine that the first word that anyone offers is mouse. So I'm going to take a second and I, um, I had earlier said a mouse walking in cowboy boots. So that's why I thought a mouse first off. Um, so first thing I'm going to do is, um, remember the word mouse. So hold on. All right. So I've got my mouse connected with my peg, which I'll reveal in a second. So, um, so I think I've got item number one. Let's say n item number two is caboose. Caboose. So item number two is caboose. So I've got my association in mind. Um, let's say number three is splash. So three is splash. All right, four is coffee. So what I'm doing, I know it's super stimulating to listen to, but what I'm doing is I'm pairing each word with its peg. So the first thing I did long, long time ago in my antiquated life, I memorized these associations. One is a bun, two is a shoe, three is a tree, four is a door, and so on, up to 10 is a hen. 
a lot of these were easy to memorize because they go with one, two, buckle my shoe, three, four, close the door, and that little child's rhyme. Um, and actually, somebody has made the list all the way up to 20 now. So if you need a longer list, you can pull that off the internet and you can get 20 peg words. I just, it, it, I only do a list of 10 things. So what I do to try and remember each word off the list is I associate the word that I've been given with the peg. So the first thing on the list needs to be associated with a, with a bun. So this is going to sound bad and I would never do this. So I love mice. Don't take, get me wrong. I used to have a pet rat. In fact, actually I had a pet mouse in a rat cage, which is a bad idea because mice can get out of rat cages. But anyway, um, so I, my visualization was a hot dog bun with a mouse in it, right? Like I was going to eat him. Um, so that's my visualization that would make the mouse memorable. I know that the bun is the peg. So this thing inside of it must be the word that I'm trying to remember. Um, number two was caboose. So I imagined a train caboose with instead of, you know, how to, cabooses have that little small um, square thing on the roof. Instead of that, I imagined the top of a boot coming through it because the caboose is carrying a boot. Um, so I was thinking of a boot, not a shoe, perhaps, but I knew I was thinking the word shoe. Um, peg word number three is tree. And the word that I tried to associate it with was splash. And I kind of imagined a tree with a big wave splashing it. Um, coffee was four. So I imagined a door made out of a Starbucks cup. <laughs> so um, you have this sort of curved door that would have to you know, sort of rotate out of the way and so on. So you make these sort of associations between the word that you're trying to remember and then these pegs, and then you end up with a really robust, easily memorable list of items that you can generate like in any order. I have students in class shout out, you know, number four and I'll say uh, coffee and then they'll shout two and I'll say caboose. And, you know, they're like, well, how are you doing that out of order? Well, this effect works so robustly that basically with one trial going through the list, now I have the list super memorized and tied to those numbers so that they can shout out one or they can shout out eight or they can shout out whatever. And all I have to do is, you know, generate my, my visualization and I can retrieve it. Now this, I wish I had known this trick when I was an undergraduate and I was taking physiological psychology and we had to learn the um, nerves of the cranium and those nerves are numbered. Like that would have been really super helpful if I could have figured out a way to use the peg word technique to recall those nerves. I was terrible at that. I today can't even tell you how many nerves there are. That is how much I just gave up on physiological psychology. Um, I am clearly a cognitive psychologist. Um, but you could use this kind of technique for any kind of material that you're trying to to remember that has an order to it. Like this is really robust for any kind of information where it matters what position it's on the list. Um, so you can try some of these techniques. Um, they work really, really well. All right. So those are my two best mnemonic devices. Um, the next segment we will pick up with some some effortful tasks that are semantic in nature.